Your glorious cause, O oh God, engages our heart. May Jesus Christ be known wherever we are. We ask not for ourselves, for your reward. The cross has saved us, so we claim your kingdom. Let your Good morning. Welcome to church. Isn't it great that it's cooler today that we can come, that we can be reminded of the wonderful gift of Christmas, which is Jesus Christ given for us, that we may have restored relationship with God. So let's stand and sing of the wonderful hope and truth that we remember on Christmas Day.
the reason for Christmas Day when our Saviour was born, not just as a baby, but to grow into be our Saviour and our good and gracious King.
Take a seat. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Lakes Church. My name is Tim, one of the pastors here. Tis the week before Christmas. So uh, school kids, if I can call you that, have you, has everyone finished school for the year? Hand up if you've still got school going. Hand up if you still want school to go. Yeah, a few adults have put that up. <laughs> Okay, kids, um, were you happy with your school photo this year? Yeah, you got a school photo? Were you happy with it? Who had a school photo with their two front teeth missing? Maybe that's on your Christmas list this year. You want your two front teeth? Oh, I'm sure there's some older people here that that's on their Christmas list as well. <laughs> You've written it down? All I want for Christmas is my two front teeth. Yeah. Uh, Deb's grandmother, um, she's, she's going to be celebrating Christmas with the Lord Jesus. She, that's a great comfort at this time of year um, that she's been with the Lord Jesus for a number of years. But she used to tell me this story over and over again of a missionary at her church who was retiring. She'd been a missionary over in Africa. This missionary lady was retiring. She'd been a single lady, dedicated her life to gospel work over there. She was coming back to Australia and she did have this African lady that had sort of been her aid and help. She'd been employed by her around the house. Um, and as, as the missionary lady was retiring and coming back to Australia, she did say to this African woman, look, thank you so much for all that you have done. I would love to give you a gift, anything in my house you may have, um, because I, I don't need it in Australia, I can't take it back, so please just take anything you want. Well, the African lady said, well, I'd like your, your teeth. Th those teeth that you keep in a jar beside your bed at night. And the missionary lady said, well, uh, well, 
Actually, I, I do need them. They're my teeth. They're, they're kind of like custom made and shaped for my mouth and they wouldn't fit you anyway. And the African lady said, oh, they do. They do. She'd been trying them on every night. That's one of those stories, I, I hope I haven't told it to you before, but my young son, Kale, says, tell me the teeth story again, <laughs> again and again. Um, look, being Christmas, I'd love to draw our hearts to our missionaries who are overseas at this time. Um, at this time of year, this is one of those times when our missionaries really feel the cost of taking the gospel to other places because they... Well, with Christmas, um, let's even take this week to try and let people know in our community about our Christmas services that are coming up. And so we've got a number of things uh, that kick off on Christmas Eve. So Christmas Eve is a Sunday, so we'll have our morning services just like now. But then our, on Christmas Eve at 5 p.m., we've got a family service, and that'll be the same at, as Christmas Day. Um, a lot of us sort of have to split um, what we do across Christmas Eve and Christmas Day to travel and catch up with family. So you might like to think about which one you'd like to come along to. Um, and also we have postcards on a table out the front. So as you're heading out later today, I'll remind you later, grab some of those. Let's um, just pop them in letterboxes and you may even have a chance to talk to someone or at work. Um, this is our last chance to invite people to Christmas. And look, our story here at the Lakes is that time and time again, year after year, heaps of people come to the Lakes simply because they've found out about a Christmas service um, through the letterbox drop. So let's take that opportunity. Okie dokie. Um, one last thing to let you know about is uh, this is for the live stream viewers. Uh, we're going to cut the live stream during the break and we'll be back in about five minutes. That's just due to an interview that we're going to have up here. Meanwhile, teens are staying with us, but Kids Church is on, so you guys can head out and let's say hi to one another.
Now, being Christmas, today's readings are from the Gospel of John, where we'll see the signs of the Messiah and his great gift to us. So please join me in opening up your physical or digital Bibles to John chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. That's John chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, For my hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some water out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of their banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realise where he had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory, and the disciples believed in him. 
Now please turn a few more chapters to John chapter 20, verses 24 to 31. John, John 20, 24. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where he, the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and he said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it in my side, stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Thank you, Danny. Um, just before you step down, Danny, do you remember who I got? You know how you said you um, did dramatic characters? Do you remember any of those? Yeah. Too, yeah, I do too. too. Yeah, tell me one. Deborah. Deborah. The judge. So, um, yes, yeah, so Danny was Deborah the judge. Uh, and uh, she looked like a mighty woman with, a, you know, the arrows and the. Yes. Uh, yeah, the bow. Yeah, yeah what else? Uh, Easter bunny at Christmas time? Easter bunny, that's right, that's right. So she was the Easter bunny that turned up at Christmas. And so all the kids said, but that's not Christmas, that's Easter. And so we drew the connection yeah. between Christmas and Easter. And you remember the other one? Was there an angel or something? No, oh, you probably, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jonah the prophet. Jonah. Yeah, yeah, okay. So she's done it all, quite a white. Thank you, Danny. It's lo so lovely to have memories. you back. Uh, so this year we'll have to think of something new. Uh, a, new, a new character, uh, the, e the Christmas angel at Easter time. How about that? Uh, all right, so isn't it beautifully decorated here? So thanks to the team uh, who put all that together, you. Um, and uh, have you, who's got a nativity set at home? Nativity set? Oh, I do too. I'll bring mine next week. It's something that I save up for Christmas uh, each year. Um, but I, I did an AI search, you know, so on, um, on Bing, you can actually search for something using AI, and so I said, give me a nativity scene, and so here's a couple of nativity scenes that, uh, that uh, Microsoft put together for me, uh, very beautiful, uh, and then I, I experimented, all right, well, I can actually try a whole lot of things out, so I try, I said, give me a 60s style nativity scene, uh, and so there it is. And I, I realised the 60s was quite a stylish time. And so I said, right, let's, let's step it. What about the 70s? I, go, I get 10 of these a day, right? So I thought, I'll have a crack. There's the 70s. Looks like Brady, Brady Bunch or the Waltons or something like that. Uh, and then the 80s. Uh, <laughs> and then the 90s, uh, which is not much different from the 80s. Uh, and then the noughties, the, and, uh, and they love with their hands in their pockets uh, in the noughties, apparently. But then I said, I, said to, I said to Microsoft, give me a realistic nativity scene. Uh, and that's what it came up with, uh, which I'm not so sure about that. There's a lot of Christmas baubles on the one uh, on the left. But did you know, now, is there a common theme in all of them that you noticed? Common theme? Baby? Yeah, there's a baby. Anything about the baby? Glowing. Glowing. Did it just flash back through them again? I oh, know, no, this is... There we go. There you go. And, and you can go... They have even need sunglasses to see this baby. Uh, all right, and so you can go back forward to the realistic one. Um, so many different variations of the nativity. Now, of course, there was a real nativity that took place 2,000 years ago. No Christmas baubles. Uh, this is the closest AI could come up with, with a realistic uh, nativity. Um, but it's interesting how 
always Jesus is glowing, uh, like you can see his glory physically on display uh, at his birth. Now, today and next week, we're going we're gonna to look at the arrival of Jesus. We might just blank the screen there. Uh, we're going to look at the arrival of Jesus from John's perspective, right? John's gospel, it's one of the four biographies of Jesus' life. Uh, and at the start of John's gospel, John says this, We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And, and Tim's going to take us to that passage in John chapter 1 and the word becoming flesh. Uh, that'll be next Sunday morning uh, and then Sunday evening and Christmas Day. So Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, I'll be doing John 3.16 and that beautiful passage that ought to be you know, stamped on our hearts or tattooed on our arm or something like that. God so loved the world. So that's, Now, when you come on that day, next Sunday or, uh, or Christmas Day, look at this. Rhonda gets about four rows to herself down the front here. Oh, what I'd love to see is you come on down the front, sit down, you know, bring your kids on your laps, all that sort of stuff, because I think we'll have a lot of people, but it feels great when there are lots of people here. But don't make it difficult for the latecomers to have to kind of, you know, nudge in all the way down the front. So does, does that message sound clear enough? So let's all pull down forward and then keep doing it every Sunday after that. It's a great, it's a great habit. Okay, now, we've seen his glory, says John, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. But then John completely skips over the, nat the nativity scene because that is not where you see the glory of Jesus on full display. So John kind of ignores that part. In fact, John skips forward 30 years to the start of Jesus' public ministry, and he gathers his disciples together. Uh, and what, what God wants us to do today, God, God does want us to see the glory of his son this Christmas. Right? That is close to God's heart. Uh, but we're not going to see that if we just focus on the little baby in the manger, because that's not where Jesus' full glory is on display. Uh, and I say this to us as Christians, that I want us to see the glory of Jesus afresh this Christmas, but also for our friends and families. We want them to see and experience the joy and wonder of the glory of Jesus and just how good he is. We want them to sing the songs, you know, joy to the world, with grateful hearts, uh, overflowing with thankfulness. Uh, so that's our heart, that's God's heart. Uh, and so let's explore the glory of Jesus uh, together. So we, we go 30 years beyond the, de the, the birth of Jesus, we, we see the first sign of Jesus' glory. Uh, and we heard it in John chapter 2 uh, that Danny just read for us. Um, so uh, he, Jesus and his disciples are attending a wedding, a big celebration. A wedding was a big deal in ancient Israel 2,000 years ago. It was the groom's responsibility to make sure there was enough wine to keep the guests happy. But a tragedy takes place at this wedding. The wine has run out. No more wine. And that, that would threaten, like that's bad enough today, but in those days it kind of brings shame on the family, shame on the bride, shame on the bride's family. Uh, to run out of wine was just a, a disaster at a wedding. Uh, and so Jesus' mum comes and finds her son and she says, Son, they've run out of wine. Can you do something about it? And notice Jesus' reaction. I don't speak to my mum like this, but Jesus says, Woman, uh, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. Now is not the time for me to reveal my glory. But all the same, his mum presses ahead, like mums sometimes do, uh, and says, do whatever Jesus tells you to do. And so nearby there are these water jars and they were water jars used by the religious leaders, the Pharisees and so on, for ritual purification. So they were part of 
the old religion uh, of the Pharisees uh, to cleanse sin. Uh, And Jesus says, take some water, (coughs) put it into those water jars and fill them to the brim. And so the servants do it. uh, And when, when they draw the water out, there's been this incredible miracle that's taken place. The water is now the best of wine. And when it's served up, all the guests are amazed and they say, this is the best wine you've served up. But most people serve up the best wine at the start while people have still got their senses alert. Uh, But you've you've saved the best to last. And verse 11, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. So there it is. Here is the first glimpse of Jesus' glory that John records for us. And notice how John calls it a sign. Now, what's the idea of a sign? A sign points, you know, alerts us to something. It points in a certain direction, like a street sign helps you know the way to go. Like, you know, we've got signs for toilets out there. If you need to go to the toilet, you know to follow the signs and they will lead you the way. But how was this miracle turning water into wine? It's a great party trick, but how is it a sign? Uh, What's so significant about this thing? Well, let me just unpack it a little bit. In the Old Testament, hundreds of years before Jesus was born, the prophets spoke about a new era that was coming, a new covenant, a new arrangement between God and his people where there would be complete forgiveness. Uh, There'd be an outpouring of God's spirit, where God's word would be written on the hearts of his people. And God would send a king, a good king, the Messiah, and he would bring all these things into effect. And this king would be the groom, and God's people Israel would be the bride. Uh, And he would take his people in love, and he would cleanse them and forgive them and make them beautiful, and then unite himself to them. Uh, That was what was going to happen when the Messiah arrived. They would be days of joy and celebration, feasting and wine, because the great reception, the wedding reception was coming. So let me show you a few quotes. Joel 3, in that day the mountains will drip new wine, a fountain will flow out from the Lord's home. So it's new wine, Uh, the days are coming, New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills. But Isaiah says, on this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare, uh, uh, what is it? A banquet of aged wine, the finest of wine. So it's new wine, and yet it's aged wine, because it's not cheap new wine. It's this beautiful, exquisite wine. And come all you who are thirsty, come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. This is a time of abundance and grace free gift from God. And so hundreds of years later, after these prophecies were given from the mouth of God, Jesus comes to a wedding and he deliberately takes those old ceremonial jars representing the old covenant, the old way of relationship with God and forgiveness of sins. But out of that, Jesus draws out this new wine But it's not just a new cheap wine, it's new aged wine. It's the best of wines. And it's like Jesus is showing that he has come to bring that old religion to an end and bring something better, something refreshing, where forgiveness is poured out completely, where God will pour his spirit in the hearts of his people and transform them so that they are worthy to be united to the Lord Jesus, to the Messiah, as a bride, to the bridegroom forever. It was a sign that Jesus, in fact, was the Messiah. The King has come. Days of refreshment had arrived. And so it ought to have filled God's people with a real sense of joy and anticipation and expectation. The bridegroom has come. 
Uh, and so in the next chapter, John the Baptist, he is speaking about Jesus because they're trying to work out who's John the Baptist. And he says, well, I'm the guy who announces the coming of the bridegroom. Look at what John says. Uh, the friend who attends the bridegroom, bridegroom waits and listens for him and he is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. And John, now Sam's going to be talking about John the Baptist in two weeks' time. Beautiful. Give me a week off on, on New Year's Eve. I can party hard because uh, Sam will, no, I'll be here listening, Sam. I'll be there. Uh, but so John the Baptist, can you see what he's doing? He's saying, I'm the guy who gets the privilege of announcing the bridegroom has arrived. And for all the godly people of Israel, they should have been waiting for the Messiah to come and take his people and forgive them and transform them and love them forever. And I pray that that joy that John spoke of will fill us this Christmas uh, as we sing joy to the world. Uh, the Lord is come. Times of refreshment have arrived in the Lord Jesus. So that's only the first sign of Jesus' glory. Uh, and throughout John's gospel, there are so many other signs. So point two, many signs of Jesus' glory. Now this is right near the end of the gospel, and uh, this is John 20. So Jesus has died. He's risen again. Thomas said, I'm not going to believe unless I feel it for myself. Uh, and he does. And then John says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written. So the ones that are contained in John's gospel have been deliberately chosen by John that you may believe Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in his name. Right? So God's desire is that we have life and life to the full. And how we get life is by believing that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the one who has brought this new age of the new wine. Um, now, I just want to point out that lots of people in Jesus' day, and even today, lots of people treat the miracles of Jesus like fireworks, uh, but they're not fireworks. So you know how fireworks work? Uh, you go and sit and you watch a firework, you know, and, and it's, they're beautiful. I love fireworks. Right? I love watching fireworks. Uh, and they, they just fill the sky and you, you're filled with wonder. And then they fizzle out and you go, again, another one. You know, and you're just hoping that you can endlessly watch these fireworks light up the sky. And when Jesus came doing miracles... The people were like sitting at a fireworks display and they're saying, do another one, do another one. Uh, and Jesus gets weary of that because it's almost like they're captured by the dazzling lights, but they're not just dazzling lights, they're signs. Right? Each of his miracles is a sign pointing to a truth that requires a response, a response of humbling before the king and believing him in him. Uh, and so they're not just random fireworks. They're deliberate signposts pointing towards Jesus being the king. Now, shout out. What, what, what signs are there in John's gospel? Uh, just have a quick word to the person next to you. I'm only going to give you 10 seconds. You, you've got to think of one at least. <clears throat> what signs are there that Jesus is the king uh, in John's gospel? Okay, what have we got? Call it out. Lazarus. All right, we go right to the end one. Yeah, raising Lazarus from the dead. That's a big sign. Bright as a fish. What's that? The bread and the fish. Oh, the bread and the fish. Yeah, yeah, you said it with a beautiful accent, though. Uh, the, yeah, yeah, so, so what was it? A number of loaves and some fish, and then he feeds the multitude. Yeah. 
There's a whole lot of healing miracles. So, so let, me, let me show you some of the signs. Notice I've, I've tried to light them up as neon signs, right? So this is just to give you a little bit of artistic effect. I, I work hard on these things. Uh, all right, so you've got the water to wine, the healing of the blind person. You've got walking on water. Uh, and you've got some of the healing miracles, you know, the lame man, the blind, uh, we've done the blind man. This, so these are, now, have a listen to Isaiah 35, verse 5 to 6. This is, this is 700 years before Jesus comes on the scene. And God says, in this new era, the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. I think it should be un, in the ears of the deaf they're not stopped, they're unstopped, right? So they can hear. Sorry about that. Um, then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Right? So th that's the time that the Messiah will bring in. And so as you start seeing the eyes of the blind open and the lame man leaping like a deer... Uh, you start to realise the times God had promised are here. The Messiah has come. So you see how they're all signs pointing in one direction. Jesus is the king. Uh, here's a few other signs. We've got the feeding of the multitude, the bread and the fish. That's the raising of Lazarus. So you see a stone rolling away from the tomb, but it could be Jesus' resurrection, couldn't it? Uh, and then you've got the cross. Now, there's lots of debate over what are the signs of John's gospel. It doesn't worry me too much, right, personally. Uh, and what do you do with Jesus' death and resurrection themselves? I wonder whether Jesus' death and resurrection, I think, I think they are signs, but they're probably like signs that say you have arrived. You know how you, some signs point and they point... But, but I, the death and resurrection of Jesus is like, here is the centrepiece. You've actually come to the most holy place. Uh, you've come to the heart. Because as you look at Jesus on the cross, it looks so inglorious. And yet there the glory of God is most clearly on display. Because you see his love for a people that reject him. You see his sacrificial courage in laying down his own life so that forgiveness might flow. And in his resurrection, you see the king conquered death, conquered sin, conquered Satan, and now victorious. And so in the death and resurrection of Jesus, they're not, they're not just pointing to something. They're actually they're the main event. We've arrived at the heart of the glory of God as we gaze on those things. Now, the biographies of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they don't record all the details of Jesus' life, right? They're very clear on that. They're selective. Um, John doesn't even record the details of Jesus' birth. Um, so he often gets neglected at Christmas time uh, because, like, there's no nativity in John. But what the, what the gospel writers do is they record all the information we need to know to be persuaded about the identity of Jesus and the wonderful joy that comes with his arrival, uh, the celebration, the, the bridegroom has come, abundant wine now flows. So, next question. Point number three, this is my final point. Why don't more people believe? Right? God has given all these signs They've been written down for us. Well, the first answer is maybe they haven't heard. Right? And this is what has inspired Danny and Sam to head off to a far-flung nation. You know, this is, our missionaries have this heart where some people haven't heard the good news of Jesus. They haven't heard that the bridegroom has come, the Messiah has arrived, time's a blessing are now flowing from him. And it's not just people in other parts of the world. There are people in our region who haven't heard. Maybe when we were growing up, you know, some of us were growing up, it was a time when a lot of people had heard. But increasingly, there are people in our community who haven't heard with, with any sense of clarity or haven't considered it in a mature sort of way. 
That's why we run life, right? And we just relentlessly run the life series. Uh, We run it so that you can bring your friends along and your family along so they can consider the claims of Jesus. And I want to say to you, Aussies, right? Aussies have a reputation of being hardened, right, to the claims of Jesus. I don't think it's as pessimistic as you think, or it's certainly not as pessimistic as the media paints it out to be. So two years ago, they surveyed Aussies. Um, you mightn't be able to see the details, but um, is there more than we can see or touch? So this is two years ago. Do you believe in ghosts? Uh, I don't think that should excite us too much, but 50% of Aussies said yes, 30% said no, uh, and then 20%, I'm mm, not sure. Do you believe in miracles? 60% yes. Do you believe in angels? 53%. Do you believe in a higher power or God? You've got, what is it? 58% saying yes, 24% saying no, probably not. Do you believe you have a soul? Right? So there's something more than you can see or touch. 70% say yes, only 16% so now, now we, we're in an era where it feels like godless atheism has won the day, but not in the hearts of most people. Uh, in, in the hearts of a lot of the gatekeepers, we're given that impression, if you just read the newspapers and watch the news on telly, but it's not quite the reality. Uh, and so here's another survey from last year. Uh, They asked Aussies, would you go to church at Christmas if you're invited? Um, 25% said no. Okay, that's all right. One in three, you'll get a knockback. 20% said I'm unsure. So worth asking, isn't it? 10% said I don't have any friends who would ask me. So it's it's a silly hypothetical question. Now, we want to challenge that, don't we? We want to get to that 10% and say, you didn't expect me to ask you. but uh, And then 45% said, yes. What is that? Uh, that, wasn't the, that wasn't the case 20 years ago, I tell you what. Uh, there's, a, there's a change in the mood of Australian society. Uh, anyway, so there it is. So if you have friends or family and you're thinking, oh, should I, shouldn't I ask them, get them along. Because chances are they'll say yes, and you'll be surprised and delighted. Uh, and what better opportunity than Christmas time to do it? So here's the challenge: invite them. Couldn't be easier than that, right? We're not saying you have to learn two ways to live and share it and personally see them converted. We're just saying invite them. Uh, give me or Tim or someone like that the job of explaining the good news, but just bring them along. Because they're open to coming. And I don't care if we have to use the overflow. Don't worry about that. Like I, what a blessing that would be. So don't hold back because you think, oh, it'll be tight. No, that's all the better. <clears throat> all right, some people just need to hear. So come back to the next slide. So why don't more people believe? Some haven't heard, but some refuse to believe. Uh, and this is a, a kind of tragic reality. But have a look at John chapter 12, where you're drawing to the end of Jesus' ministry. So we're days before his crucifixion at this point. And John just makes the summary of saying, even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. Um, It's not saying they didn't have enough evidence. John's saying, no, no, they they had heaps of evidence, but they refused to believe in him. Now, I I find that surprising. People saw the amazing miracles of Jesus with their own eyes, but something was so corrupted in their hearts that they refused to believe. It was kind of like, I don't want Jesus as my king. I want to run my life my way. He threatens my independence too much. Uh, And I'm sure the same happens today. Lots of people... Like, you meet lots of people who have all sorts of objections why they don't follow Jesus. But some of those objections are a smokescreen. And the bottom line is, they don't believe because they don't want to believe. It doesn't 
suit their independence or their lifestyle. They, they actually, maybe they don't get that the bridegroom has come. Maybe they don't get the joy that this, this means for their lives. Maybe they think, somehow I'm better off without him, but many people refuse to believe, and it's not just an intellectual object uh, 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 barrier. It's actually a, a willful, I'm not going to follow Jesus. Um, I want to run my life my own, own way. And there's a third response that John gives us, and that is some are afraid to believe. So uh, this is the same chapter 12, just before Jesus dies. At the same time, many, even among the leaders, believed in Jesus. They believe him. They know it's all true. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved human praise more than the praise of God. Now, that's, that's sad too, isn't it? You know, for someone to know that this is true, but there's just too much personal cost. People might not like me. I may be put on the outer if I follow Jesus, so I'm actually going to go the path of rejection too. And I just want to say, don't be intimidated yourself. Don't be intimidated by this noisy minority. Uh, Because it is a minority, but it's a noisy minority, and it feels like a powerful minority. Uh, A few years ago, it felt like the world was overrun by angry atheists. And, And it certainly felt like they'd won the day. Time magazine even said, God is dead back in the 60s. But wow, if he's dead, there's still a lot of people who believe in it. Like it's just, it just doesn't match the reality. So people keep calling on us to dump Christmas. This poster in New York, I don't know if you can read it. It says, keep the merry, dump the myth. And that is interesting, isn't it? So it's got Father Christmas, keep the merry, all right, hold on to that bit, but dump the myth. And what's the myth? The myth's not Santa. That's the good bit of Christmas. The myth is Jesus. Now, it's just false advertising, right? There's not, there's not a professor in history throughout the world who denies the birth, life, and death of Jesus. Right? And so to say it's a myth, right? not everyone believes in the resurrection of Jesus, but historians are united in believing that there was a man, Jesus, who had a major impact on our world, and many claimed he rose from the dead. Um, here's a shopping centre in Melbourne this year and I don't know if you can see the Christmas display Merry Everything right? so they just felt like we can't say Merry Christmas it's just too politically incorrect we don't want to be favouring Jesus at Christmas time so let's just say Merry Everything and we might as well say Merry Nothing because it's it's kind of meaningless statement but we just put it out there and it sounds like we're caught up in the Christmas cheer Um, And yet, as we've seen, people are far more open to God and Jesus than we might imagine. Uh, And in fact, there's a new book that has just come out called The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God. Uh, And the subtitle is Why New Atheism Grew Old and Secular Thinkers Are Reconsidering Christianity Again. It's a fascinating book. I haven't read it. I haven't read a page of it. But... Thankfully, he's produced a podcast, which is far more of my liking, right? So I don't have to... Because I read a book at night these days, and within a paragraph, I fall asleep. It's, it's a beautiful way to fall asleep. But I can do this. I can be mowing the lawn, listen to a podcast. And it's just... It really is surprising how many of those who have been part of that new atheist movement have become jaded with it. And some of them are actually embracing... Jesus, or belief in God. Uh, and it's surprising but exciting. And even here at the lakes, uh, just what a joy. Like we're, we've still been advertising for an engaging pastor. Where's, our, where's, where's, um, where's young Alan Wood? There he is, look at him. And I noticed all the men were wearing shirt, nice shirts, Christmassy vibe. How good was that? And the ladies too. Um, 
But Alan, so Alan Woods stepped into that role. We've still been waiting for someone you know, to employ in a longer term capacity. But we've seen many men and women from our region come to hear the claims of Jesus and put their trust in him and they've become followers of Jesus with us. Now, what a joy in hardened, secular Australia to see God continuing to do his work because it is a beautiful message we have about the bridegroom coming, the new wine, forgiveness and, and the spirit and joy available through him. Uh, so I'm going to lead us in prayer. Will you pray with me? God, our Father, this is your world. You made each one of us for a relationship with you. We are sorry we go our own way. We can be self-centred as if everything is all about us. Uh, we are sorry that we sometimes fear what other people think rather than fearing you and seeking to honour you. Father, we want to thank you for your son, Jesus, for the joy that comes to the world through his arrival. Your long-awaited king bringing forgiveness, bringing times of refreshment, new wine, celebration, healing, hope and peace. Father, please turn our hearts to your king, Jesus, this Christmas. Please forgive us. And Father, we pray for our region and for our family and friends. We pray that they will receive our invitation, that they will come along, that you will soften their hearts and that they too may receive the blessing of knowing Jesus as Saviour and King. Please give us courage and confidence in this, knowing that Jesus is greater uh, than any other force in our world. Uh, yeah, we pray for your mercy to be poured out on this part of our world uh, as for other parts of our world, we pray. Please fill our hearts with joy as we worship your King, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. How about we stand and we sing to our God who is greater and stronger than anything that we face in this world and he proved that by rising from death and beating death even itself at the cross. So let's stand and sing together.
such hope and assurance that surrounds us through the good times and the difficult times, knowing that if our God is for us, then who could be against us? As we sing our final song, let's cast our eyes as we long for Jesus' return, as we remember when he came into that world, into our world all those years ago for our salvation. As we head out now into what is probably going to be a busy and hustle bustle kind of week, um, may we all take time to remember the Lord Jesus. Um, think about who you can invite across the Christmas period, as Dave was encouraging us. Um, we can invite. Just by inviting, we place them under the blessing that the heavenly host proclaimed thousands of years ago to those shepherds. Glory to God in the highest and God's favour upon humankind. Amen? Amen. Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs>